I've got really good news. My wife is free of cancer, and I'm really, really grateful for that. <laughs> Two years ago, Sally was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and she went through chemotherapy for six months. And then she's had a whole bunch of tests over the last year, so we're really grateful. She had another big one uh, a week ago, a PET scan, and it came back clear. So she's been clear for a year, and we're really thankful. It's so wonderful to be here this morning, and I feel like I owe you an immense debt of gratitude because you helped pray me through that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So many times, Claire Hart and Miranda said, we're praying for you, we're praying for you, and I am exceedingly grateful. I was meditating on a verse out of Isaiah this last week, Isaiah 43, and it says, when you come through the fire, you won't be burned. I don't know about you, but I don't like going through the fire. I don't like going through those hard times. But one of the things I have realized in this season I've been through is how immensely faithful God is in the midst of it. I, I wouldn't choose to go through cancer, but I have to say to you this morning, I don't regret what I've been through because there was such a preciousness of the Lord in the midst of that, that fire. And when he takes us through a fire, we can know that he will be there with us in the midst of it. His grace, his strength, his enabling to get through it. He is faithful in the midst of every, every season. And I am so thankful. And I know part of that was your prayers. And I just want to thank you this morning. I'm grateful. Thank you so much. Sally and I had a chance to go to the States, uh, where we're from. We've been living here in South Africa for almost 10 years. And uh, we took a little break last year, so um, Sally went back and we saw our grandkids and kids and got some rest and see family. But uh, it's really good to be home. We're very, very grateful to be in South Africa, where, where we live now. This is our home. Somebody said, aren't you planning to go back to the States? And I said, no. Uh, They've got enough problems. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Some people think America is the promised land, but uh, I've been there and I can promise you it's not the promised land. <laughs> Just ask Donald Trump and he'll tell you. <laughs> I've written a few books, Sally and I together. Uh, one of the books I've written is called Learning to Love People You Don't Like. How many of you know that's the real challenge? <laughs> yeah. It's easy, this is Jesus' words, now I'm paraphrasing, but Jesus said, it's easy to love people who love you. I really love people who like me. <laughs> but Jesus said the test for us is when it's hard. And so he talked to us, he taught us about how to do that. So uh, that's a book about how Jesus taught us to love when it's hard to love. And um, for many years, Sally and I lived in Amsterdam for 18 years. We lived in the inner city. A really tough city filled with lots of problems, a lot of sex industry, pornography, a lot of crime, drugs. We lived right in the middle of that. And so the question we asked the Lord often was, would you please help us to love the city the way you love the city? A prayer that somebody taught me to pray is, Lord, let me see what you see and let me feel what you feel and let me think how you think. And we fell in love with the, with the city. Um, I had many Dutch people say, Ik had van Amsterdam. Uh, but I said, ik, ik ben nu een I come out of the city. I'm a, I'm a person of the city. I love Amsterdam. So we fell in love with it. And we wrote a book about some of the things we learned about loving the city where we live. And I, I can now say I love Cape Town. <laughs> it's a big city. It's got big challenges. But it's a beautiful city with lots of potential. And um, our challenge, our invitation is to see the city with the eyes of God. That's the title of that book. And then I've brought uh, Father Heart of God and um, Living on the Devil's Doorstep. Those are books we've written. And I also brought a book that Sally's written. I forgot to bring a copy in there in the table back in the back here or in the entranceway if you'd like to come by the book table. Uh, the theme for the month for the church here is belonging. Uh, I'm glad that I belong. I belong to Sally. We've belonged together for 48 years. 
July, August, September, October, November, <laughs> December, January. Uh, 48 years, eight months, and uh, five days. <laughs> uh, I belong to the McClung f clan. We're Scotch-Irish in our background, so I can say I belong to that brand, so to speak. That's our background. Uh, I belong to Jesus, and I love that, that I have a place to belong, a family to belong to. One of the things that Jesus did is that he created church for us. He created spiritual family. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, made a choice that they wanted us to have belonging as well. They wanted us to share the closeness that existed between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they created Adam and Eve, and they had a plan that Adam and Eve would be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so today we belong. We belong to the new covenant people, the people of God. And there's the church universal, but there's also the church local. Uh, it's not just enough to say I belong to Jesus and his people, but the question is where do we belong? Everybody needs a spiritual home, a place to belong to, a family to belong to. And I'm thankful that we can have local churches. I'm a huge believer in finding a spiritual family. I find some people kind of what I would call spiritual orphans, and they kind of wander around. Some of them are a little proud of the fact that they don't belong any place. Other people are pretty broken about it. And when we are spiritual orphans, something's missing in our life. We miss a place, a people, where we can be accountable, where we can speak into people's lives, speak encouragement, we can speak truth, and they can speak back into our lives. And it's beautiful to belong. If you're a part of this church family, you have a family to belong to. So God expresses his love to this planet uh, through the church. God's spirit dwelled in the Old Testament in the tabernacle. And then when they built the temple, God's spirit was in the temple. And then when Jesus came on earth, Holy Spirit lived in Jesus. But now that Jesus has ascended into heaven, he lives in you and I. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When the Bible speaks of the temple in the Greek language in the New Testament, it does not speak in the singular. It does not say, you are the temple. It says, you are the temple. And together we are the dwelling place of Holy Spirit. So in the Old Testament, when people met with God, when the horizontal plane of humanity came in contact with the vertical plane of God, where did they meet? They met at the temple. The priests would go in on behalf of the people into the presence of God. So there was that meeting place. But now, you and I are that meeting place. If people meet with God, they do it in this temple. So we become the extension, can I say it, the living reality of the Spirit of God. That's a little scary sometimes. Uh, I was thinking very deep and profound and wonderful spiritual thoughts a couple weeks ago. Then I got in my car. I got into busy traffic. Somebody cut me off. I saw somebody throwing rubbish out the window. And the Holy Spirit seemed to go far away, and I got angry. <laughs> and then I started thinking, wow, I'm thinking all these beautiful thoughts about being spiritual. And so quick I became very upset with this guy just throwing trash out the window and how people were driving. And it reminded me, uh, I need to stay close to Jesus and I need to stay close to people if I'm going to be an example of Holy Spirit. It's really hard to be an example all by ourselves. We're created for relationship. We're not created to be isolated or alone like Tom Cruise to be abandoned on an island someplace all by herself. No, shipwrecked. We're to belong to a family and through that family. So I like, I like both expressions of local church. I love the celebrations we have on Sunday. Uh, it was so beautiful this morning to be able to worship with you. And I know my wife was really touched and she leaned over and said to me, can we go and take communion together just to say thank you that I'm alive and I have my health. And so we did that. We went up front. So the celebration times we have 
touch us in one way. It reminds us of the bigness of the church. It reminds us of our purpose. It's a time to be renewed in our vision and our faith. But we also need the other expression of church, and that's small groups, or cell groups, as we call them here in the church. So the big meeting gives us faith and vision and purpose. The smaller meetings, the smaller group, gives us a sense of relationship and intimacy. And that's where we work out our belonging. Uh, I don't know about you, but um, I live a pretty busy life. How many of you live pretty busy? If you live on this planet and you're surviving and you're making it, you're busy. There's lots of stresses on our lives, a lot of pressures, economic stresses. There's work stresses. There's political stresses and crime stresses. And yeah, we have all these stresses in our life. And one of the beautiful provisions of God to help us through all the stresses and pressures we feel in life is that we can touch each other's lives on a regular basis, where we can come together and we can share our hearts with each other and be real with each other. We all need that, where we have opportunity just to open up ourselves. Sally and I started a little cell group several years ago, and uh, in our cell group, we liked chocolate. Or should I say chocolate really liked us? <laughs> How many of you know the difference between liking chocolate and chocolate really liking to kind of visit with you and stay with you and just, yeah, be a part of your life? <laughs> and uh, we had chocolate the first few times we came together as a cell group, so we called ourselves Chocolate Church. <laughs> we were a chocolate cell group. So whatever your interest is, I've known people who have had motorcycle cell groups, and I know people who have had sports cell groups, and they've had common interests. Whatever that interest is, it's important to have a place to touch in a personal, relational way. Otherwise, something happens. This world can kind of squeeze us into, can I call it a dehumanizing mold? And we become less than human. The busyness and the stress and the pressures and the obligations and all the pain and the fear can overwhelm us. But if we have that sweet spot, or can I say those two sweet spots, where we gather for worship and celebration on a Sunday, but we gather with other people during the week where it's more personal. Not everybody has the opportunity here this morning to say, here's my need. Here's what I'm going through right now. Would you pray for me? Here's the victory that I've had. Will you joy rejoice with me? But in a smaller group, like a cell group, then we have that opportunity to touch hearts and it keeps us, can I say, human. Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. What Jesus came to do for us is lift us out of what I call subhumanity, where we're living less than what he created us to be. And he came to raise us up. But then we need to sustain each other, and we do that in small groups together. Now, I don't know if, if you've ever thought about this, but the actual, the first Christian cell group. Anybody ever wondered where the first Christian cell group was? Actually, it was in Israel 2,000 years ago. <laughs> and the first leader of a Christian cell group was Jesus. <laughs> have you ever thought about Jesus being a cell leader? I wonder what it would have been like to be in that first group. Well, they were 12, right? <laughs> It is not just men, by the way. If you look carefully in the New Testament, though the culture would not allow them to travel in mixed company, men and women together, Jesus had women disciples as well. In Luke chapter 8, it describes some of these women who traveled closely with Jesus in kind of two groups. But thankfully in our culture today, we can actually meet together men and women. We can meet together young and old. We can meet together black and white. We can meet together whether we have big jobs or little jobs, and we can share our lives together. So Jesus modeled for us what it is like to have that kind of cell group. Jesus modeled honesty. How many of you know Je Jesus faced temptations? Have you ever thought about that? He faced real temptations. Uh, in my pocket, I have a credit card. I don't have a lot of them. I used to, but they used to get me in trouble, so I've just limited it to a few now. <laughs> I have a Discovery credit card. Now, Jesus had a credit card. 
but he never used it. How many of you know what kind of credit card Jesus had? It's called deity. He was divine. Here's the way we describe Jesus. He was truly God and truly human. He was fully divine and he was fully a man. When Jesus went through temptation, I used to think this. Well, I know why he lived a perfect, sinless life. Because he was divine. But here's the deal. And all the temptations and pressures that Jesus went through, he did not pull out the deity credit card and just charge it. He didn't kind of lean on his deity to live perfect, perfect life. You know how he lived sinless? You know how he stayed free from temptation? Is he stayed in fellowship with the Father. And he lived close to the Holy Spirit. And he did that for you and I. So that we would know that when we face temptation, that we could call upon the Father, we could call upon the Holy Spirit, and we could be free as well. So it's not just that Jesus had an unfair advantage. He actually went through everything we went through. That's what the Bible teaches us. It wouldn't be actually honest to say he went through everything we went through. And then he kind of pulled on his deity. He went through everything you went through, every temptation. Now just think for a moment, all the temptations you faced in the last week. There's the food temptation. There's the chocolate temptation. There's the sex temptation, the pornography temptation. There's the drug temptation. There's the anger temptation. There's the fear temptation. Every single one of them. Nothing you've ever felt, nothing any human being has ever felt, Jesus went through it. And how did he stay the way he did? He lived close to the Holy Spirit. He lived close to the Father. And he had a band of people that he lived life with. Now we know some of his temptations. For example, when he was in the garden alone before he went to the cross, he faced the temptation of not wanting to die on the cross. We know how he prayed in the garden. You remember his prayer. Father, what did he pray? Let this cup pass from me. This cup of suffering. That's how Romans, by the way, used to kill some of their prisoners. They would line them up. They would fill a goblet full of poison water, poison drink. They would hand it to the first prisoner. They'd force him to drink it. He'd drink it, he'd fall dead, and they'd take it out of his hands and hand it to the next one and to the next one. And then if all of them drank it and there were two or three or four left, they could go free. And Jesus said, let this cup, this poisonous drink, this facing the cross, taking the weight of all the sin of the world upon myself, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Now, how did that get into the Bible? Well, you might say, well, wait a minute. There were some of his disciples with him. We know there was three disciples with him. But where were they when Jesus was praying? They were sleeping. <laughs> Jesus even rebukes them, doesn't he? Say, couldn't you just tarry with me? <laughs> couldn't you be with me? How did it get in the New Testament? Jesus shared his temptation with those same disciples. He modeled for us, can I say, how to do authentic cell group. So a cell group is not a place to come together and brag about how good we are. How many want to be a part of a cell group where everybody's doing really, really, really well, never has any problems? Anybody want to be a part of a cell group like that? I don't want to be a part of that. I wouldn't feel like I could be real. So Jesus modeled for us authenticity. He was the real deal. He was genuine. And he shows us how important it is then for cell groups to be a place where we can belong with our honesty and our problems. Uh, Jesus modeled genuine care for people in cell, his cell group. He allowed his disciples to be right where they were at their level of maturity. Have you ever thought about it? 
I mean, think about all the disciples Jesus chose. I wish I could have been a disciple consultant. I would, I, I would have given Jesus advice. I would have come along beside him and said, now Jesus, now just, I've read the New Testament, now let me, let me tell you how it's gonna work out. Don't take Judas to be your treasure. You're gonna have some money problems. And then I could have told him about Peter. Jesus, you're a carpenter, you don't understand. Peter was a fisherman. You ever been around somebody who fishes all the time? I mean, like, wives, any of your husband bring fish home? My wife used to say to me, you clean it outside. You catch it, you clean it. <laughs> Peter was like up and down. He was emotionally unstable. <laughs> he, he needed serious psychological counseling. <laughs> and he swore. Can you imagine a redheaded fisherman? <laughs> And think about Thomas. I mean, just imagine your cell group getting together and everybody's real spiritual and you're having an honest moment of encouragement and everybody's like very positive. And then Thomas says, actually, I have a lot of doubts and I don't believe it and I'm struggling. This is not, I don't know if this is really true. Who would like a doubting Thomas in your cell group? <laughs> oh, or how about John? He became so spiritual. He wrote the Gospel of John. Such a strong guy. But you remember when he started? He went to his mother, sent his mother to Jesus, and his mother said, please, when my son John gets to heaven, can he sit right next to you in heaven? <laughs> he was a little ambitious for leadership, wasn't he? He wanted like the best place. <laughs> and on and on it goes. How about, how about like, the, an ISIS terrorist. How many would like a terrorist in your cell group? Anybody want like a, rad, a really radical person who's just like violent? Jesus called, do you remember his name? Simon, the zealot. The zealots were like a political party. They were committed to the violent overthrow of the Roman regime that was occupying their land. And Jesus chose a terrorist. How many of you know Jesus loves terrorists? Some of you are going like, Floyd, you really stepped across the line right now. A doubter and an unstable fisherman and a thief. What did Jesus do? He chose common, ordinary people and he created, can I call it, safety? Here's the point where people could be real with each other, they could touch base. So that's what cell groups do. Cell groups create a place where we can come and connect hearts and be real with each other, not just fake it. Uh, the church I grew up in as a young man, people didn't know how to be honest. We had a very dishonest spirituality. How are you doing? Oh, praise the Lord. I'm doing so well, glory to God. We didn't just say glory to God, we said glory to God. <laughs> we had like a, if anybody here wants to be a TV evangelist, I can give you coaching. Because <laughs> in our church we said, we didn't say glory, we said glory. <laughs> How are you doing brother? Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, nobody was real. I withdrew from that church because it was fake. It was plastic. They were imitation Christians. They weren't real. And therefore, our spiritual growth could not be real. Because people were not getting transparent. So people who go through life smiling all the time and saying praise the Lord all the time often have secret problems they're hiding deep inside. And if they don't allow themselves to be honest, and others will not allow themselves to be honest, how can they grow? So a cell group does something else that's really important. Jesus quoted 16 different books in the Bible in his talks. Jesus knew the scripture. So where did they go as a reference point for dealing with their problems and their temptations? They went to the scriptures. And in those days, they had the Old Testament 
And now we have the New Testament. So where do we go in a cell group as a reference point? It's like our map. <laughs> oh, how thankful my wife is that we have GPS. Because before GPS, I was too proud to stop and say I'm lost. Aren't you glad, sweetheart? It solved some marriage problems and tensions in our lives. That's what maps are for, but most guys don't like to really say we're lost. They'll say they'll figure it out. The Bible is our map. It gets us to where we're going. And not only does it get us to the right destination, it gives us a reference point for where we are right are today. So cell groups that are healthy refer to the word. Now, here's something else we learn about Jesus as a cell group leader, and this relates to the Bible as the source or the guide. Jesus used many different methods to teach his disciples. And by the way, um, I'm referring to Jesus as a cell group leader. I'm referring to Jesus about everything these days in my life. I'm 70 years of age. I've been serving Jesus for a long time. And I've made it my goal for the last 15 years. And as long as I live, I want to make sure that everything is related back to Jesus everything back to Jesus. So Jesus is our example. How did he teach his disciples? Well, some people think he just sat down and he taught them. Devin, is it? Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Second time we've shaken hands. I won't forget. Kevin. He didn't just say, Kevin, the Bible says this and this and this, and you should do this and this and this, and don't ask any questions. Just obey. Jesus didn't do that. I've been in small groups where people have done that. And I didn't stay very long myself. Because, <laughs> hey, who wants to join a small group to hear somebody talk the whole time all by themselves? Hello? You with me? Sorry if that's what you want to do, if you want to lead a cell group and talk a lot. Maybe some people want to, want to come and just listen to you the whole time. Praise God if you have a group like that. But most people don't want to just come and hear one person do all the talking. How did Jesus teach? He asked questions. He told stories. He got his disciples in discussions. And he did it commonly in what we call the rabbinical matter, manner, when there was back and forth. That's how rabbis taught. They asked questions and they engaged the hearts and their minds. Why? Because they didn't want their followers just to believe with their mind, but not without their heart. He wanted it to get deep into their hearts. And that required for them to interact with it, to, to be able to digest it, to chew it over. So you know you can't get food that's going to be healthy for you by just putting it in your mouth and swallowing it, right? <laughs> And it's the same way with biblical food. We have to get it in, in small bites. We have to chew on it. And we have to then let it go down slowly so that it'll produce nutrition for us and energy. Well, these are a few suggestions that I have. And if you want more, then I suggest you go back to the source. And that's Jesus himself. He was the optimal, if I can call it, cell group leader. One of his goals, by the way, I can just mention this in passing, is... He wanted to reproduce himself. So wise cell groups want to reproduce and multiply. They want to keep going. Because we've learned after time that those cell groups that just stay together, they actually start dying together <laughs> if there's no reproduction. And Jesus took his disciples with him. And everywhere they went, they were on a mission reaching out to other people. Uh, I've been doing cell groups for a long time. I've observed them for the last 50 years in church. The cell groups that are the healthiest are the cell groups that all have an outreach focus of some kind, that they're wanting to give and share and reach out. It's a beautiful thing, by the way, as parents. Maybe you'll have your kids with you all the time in your cell group. Maybe you won't. That's, of course, up to the cell groups, but how you do that. But here's one thing you can do. You can model for your children that following Jesus is about reaching out to other people in some way. It can be practical, it can be through creativity, it can be a service project, a neighborhood you focus on, it can be one family. But parents, this is something beautiful we can pass on to our children. Our kids have it today. 
because they watched us do this in our small groups as we were growing up. Okay, I just wanted to share those ideas about Jesus as being a cell group leader. I think we're going to give a chance to actually pray for the cell group leaders, but I'm going to turn it back over to Gerard, and then we'll go from here.